next speaker is Shane Hartman, speaking on the topic of smartphones. For those of you who don't know Shane, he holds a master's degree in digital forensics from the University of Central Florida and holds a CISSP and GRAM certification. He's also a frequent speaker at the local security events and teaches security courses over by USF. Let's give a round of applause. Okay. Welcome. Thank you guys very much. Um, I got a lot to cover in a little bit of time, so I'm going to kind of brush through things a little bit because I know only now I have so much time. What I'm going to talk about today is a component that's in your smartphones called NFC. And we're going to get to that in just a second, but what do I do? I uh, run a small company called Spectre Labs. We do research and we do digital forensics, some training and those kind of things. I also teach at USF, which we talked about. I wrote a book on Android Malcode a couple of years ago just because I was in it and started messing with that kind of stuff. And then you'll see my email and Twitter feeds uh, at the end also. So let's go ahead and get into this. What is NFC? If I can tell you one thing, it's not that. It is a component that is part of your smartphone. And really what it stands for is near-field communication. It is a set of technology and protocols that have been built in to allow what they call secure communication in small amounts of data. Now the security part of it is kind of a, a misnomer. They, it's almost like security through obscurity because the transfer that it is is usually four to maybe ten centimeters in length. Because it's so close, they figure that they don't necessarily have to secure it. Because no one's going to be able to sniff in between that, like as you're going to pay on a car payment going, let me get in between there and put a sniffer in. It just doesn't work that way. So they kind of left some things open for you, subject to interpretation. It is part of an RFID standard, which if you're familiar with uh, radio frequency ID, it's a broader spectrum, but this is the high frequency section of it. And it operates in 13.56 megahertz. So very high. And like I said, the range is 4 centimeters. Uh, here's its data rates, 106, 212, and 424 kilobits per second, i.e. slow. So you're not going to be putting a lot of data across on this type of thing. So why would I be interested in this at all? Why, would, why are we here and that kind of stuff? Well. One of the things is it's on a lot of mobile devices. It kind of went the wayside for a little while, but with Apple Pay coming along, these have been reintroduced back into the mainstream of your phones. You'll find them on the Samsung phones, you'll find them on Apple phones, and most of the Androids. Um, not everybody knows what, even what there are. They know about Smart Pay and they know that kind of thing, but they don't really understand the technology that's behind it. So I wanted to kind of figure it out myself. The thing that I found out when I first started working with it is it's not a one-purpose technology, i.e. it's not just for making payments. You can do a lot of other stuff with it. Um, this will apply mostly to the Android side of the house. Apple has made it a commitment to keep it very closed and only allow payment systems on it. They won't open it up for any other development type functions. So at least at this point. Um, so it's being repurposed, at least on the Android side of it, into a bunch of different types of markets where you can use these type of things to do stuff. Um, anything from like unlock your doors to purchase stuff. Um, it's also, like I said, the underpinning of mobile payments. So here's some of the things that it's used for. Marketing, uh, controlling device settings. Uh, you actually have some video games that are, uh, use it. This is one of those. It's got an NFC chip right in the bottom of it. It keeps track of your scores and stuff. This is one of the Nintendo type, type things. There's other ones that are out there too. Um, you can send and receive files to each other at close range. Um, you can also, uh, like I said, unlock doors, control things around your house, credit card payments, list. It keeps going on and on. And Europe and South America and Japan, for that matter, really have embraced it. So there's a lot more of it there. If you do ever travel overseas, you'll see a lot more of this type of technology in place in tokening and stuff like that, which I'll talk about here in just a minute. But here's some of the few places that you are going to see it. Some of them you'll see here. Some of them, like I said, you'll see overseas. Um, we have things called smart posters. We'll talk about it in a minute. You also have this one there that looks like a little kind of armband. And I hadn't seen one for a while. I knew you could, you could buy them, but I originally read the article that it was for like state fairs and things like that, but I didn't want you pulling your wallet in and out. And what you do is you load it up with a certain amount of money, and you could go to any vendor and click it in. 
and then it would deduct that amount on it, and it just had it was like just like a pay set. Then I found out our lovely Walt Disney World right over here in Orlando has something called smart bands. These smart bands are NFC chips. So what they do is they link to your account, and then you can charge anything you want to your room or whatever you have it sunk up to. So this it is here. So just think that this is not some technology that's foreign. They're using it in all kinds of stuff. Um, the other stuff, uh, the NFC ring, which is kind of cool. It's a way you can control your phone or devices. There's just a chip embedded in the ring. There's also some people that have been getting into what we call biohacking, where they're actually putting the NFC chip under their skin, and then they can control door locks and things like that, that they want to do via the same type of technology. So, as far as your phone goes, what is it active? Um, it's usually active when your phone is not asleep and it's unlocked. Um, it used to be a little bit different with the Android phones. If they were on but locked, they could still be accessed, but that's not true anymore. Once Ice Cream Sandwich came out, they went ahead and took that functionality away and made it so that you had to log in. Um, you could wake it up occasionally if you knew the targets, um, if you text them, because they would come up with that automated message and you repeat the text. But again, they went ahead and fixed that vulnerability as well. So what they're doing is they're slowly fixing these little bugs that they fix along the way as we discover them, what you can and can't do with them. Now, like I said, NFC works in about three different modes. Um, it's got a reader writer mode. It's got a peer-to-peer -to, -peer to allow transfer of data between the two of them. And it's got something called host card emulation mode, which is what you're mostly familiar with with the Pay series. So let's kind of break down each one of these and let's go see where the evil is. So, NFC reader writer mode. This is going to be where it's called passive mode, where it deals with the tags, the things like what I just showed you here. Um, the way they work is it's an inductive type of technology where it uses the power of the phone to charge it. So, this chip in here has no power, it has no nothing, it's almost indestructible. I actually took one of these things and ran it through like a fireplace and it still worked as long as the inductor was still in intact, the chip stayed working. Um, you can see another example of a keychain version of it there. But when it gets close enough, what happens is the power from the, the phone will charge that, that inductor and then it will immediately start transferring it. The, the interesting thing about that is because it's, it's just an inductor, it has no logic or anything, it will start transmitting as soon as it gets enough juice. Now there are several different types of tags that are out there. There are type 1, there's actually through type 5, and the different types of tags mostly store different amounts of data. There's a couple different specifications. <coughs> this one that I have here is a Topaz, which is a type 1 card. There's also a MyFair and MyFair Classic. Um, the interesting thing about those is that depending on which one you have, there's some vulnerabilities that can be introduced to them. You can clone them. You can sometimes erase them. You can create what we call a race condition with Topaz chips like this and MyFair chips where this chip actually responds faster than all the rest of the chips. So if I put this one over or near another one, it will read this one first versus the other one. So, and that one still, this still works today. So how does the communication itself actually work? Once it is charged and it starts to transmit data, it transmits it in what's called NDEF format, which is for NFC, uh, NFC transmission. And what it has is it has an overlay of a message and then it breaks it down into each individual record that it has inside of it, and it can have multiple records. And those records themselves can tell it to do stuff, like I said, turn on and off the phone, <coughs> uh, do whatever it may, may want to do. An example of that is kind of looks like this. This is what NDEF data looks like in the raw. And you can see up at the top here, this is like the wake up command that you'll see on, on chips. And then it will start going into read next, read next, and read next. And what I don't know if you guys can't see it necessarily really clear, but what happens right here is that is a, um, it's a MAC address for a Bluetooth device. So this one was for handoff. And down here at the bottom where it's highlighted, it tells the application, or it's telling the computer, or whatever it may be, what application should be used to leverage that. In this case, it was NFC tasks that was done that. Now there are about four or five standard types of things that you can do without having to rely on other software. One of them has to be like a URL, another one's a dialer, and an emailer. Those are the places where some fun stuff can happen depending on what you have. 
I'll get to that in a minute. All right, so where are those evils in the tag? Um, data transmit from the chips requires no authentication. It'll just, as soon as it gets charged, it'll go ahead and send it over. That means if you get up close to a tag and you have your, and you have it, uh, your reader is automatically enabled, it will read it no matter what. It will try to determine if it doesn't have uh, a, a, your app that it's referencing, it will try to load that specific app in. So if, let's say I have some awkward app, whatever I created, and I want you to do it, if you put your NFC chip near it and it's supposed to load that one, it will go to the Google Play Store and look for it. So that's kind of how that one works. But it doesn't work that way with, say, like URLs and email because those apps are traditionally inside of it, so they're handled by the actual NFC stack directly. Um, so other things. Um, chips can be programmed, I told you that. Go to websites, send email, we'll have myself. Send text messages, dial phone numbers. They can also be used to turn on on and off things like Bluetooth and Do Not Disturb and, and things like that. But those require an extra app, usually, like an NFC task or that. If you know that person that you're wanting to get at has that particular app on it, Feel free to program a tag and get near them because it'll work. Um, these are kind of some of the other examples. Yeah, kind of what NFC task looks like. It just brings up a big list and says, "What do you want to do?" And then you click on each one of those. You say, "I want to connect to this Wi-Fi spot." And it says, "Okay, enter the credentials, even if it's a WPA, and it'll put it on the chip for you." This is kind of one of those things where you have a whole bunch of friends that come over and you don't want to share your Wi-Fi password. You give them, you let them interface with the chip, and then it says, do you want to connect to this Wi-Fi? Sure, let's go. You know, that kind of, so you don't have to share your password or reset it after they all leave. Another place is smart posters. Anybody seen these out in the wild anywhere? Occasionally, the place where you're going to mostly see them is probably airports and in major metropolitans like New York City and Seattle and that kind of thing. It's interesting because they're marketing materials, and what they do is they put something on the chip, usually to go to a URL, so that you can get something, like get a free ticket, get a free MP3, whatever it may be for your device. Um, this one, I think, was for, uh, for some kind of music that you could download. Well, it requires an authentication, and that's what's kind of weird. Because that's out in the public, that means I can kind of mess with it. If I can't get into the chip, I can always try to put one over top of it. Again, we can create the race condition, and we can go wherever they want. Any of your, you guys have seen QR codes that are out in the wild, right? Well, the interesting thing about a QR code is you don't necessarily, you can do other ways to kind of figure out what it is. You can't figure out what the chip is, almost, unless you put a reader software, just like a QR reader that doesn't activate on it. Um, let's see, first close chip enterprise, here's another version of it. Um, some of them are putting, starting to put some Riker text in, or they can use a more expensive chip that allows them to actually digitally sign the chip. I haven't run into one yet, but I don't see a lot of chips out and about, so it's hard to see where that, I would, if I were in Europe, I'd probably be able to do a little bit more of that kind of stuff. Um, here is another place with the hotel keys. They're starting to start to convert these over. It's not so much on the phones as much as it is in the cards. The cards are where some of that stuff is. Because what they're doing is they're writing, like those little chips, they're writing it to a card. The card is what you're going to go after. So they're subject to either, they may even be digitally signed, but even if they're digitally signed, they found sometimes they can clone them. Or in other words, duplicate the exact key and make more than one. Um, there's also uh, some confusion in the market about what they should be using and how that, how that goes. And the reason is, is because you've got technology people coming in trying to tell people what to do, and they don't understand what the technology issues are, so they're just going with cheap. Um, let's see. All right, let's go away a real quick demo. I want to show you something that shows how that authentication does not work. All right, what you have here, whoops, it'll show up. Ah, oh, it's not going to work. Ah, it's not going to work. All right, what I was going to show you is I created an actual version of that. Uh, uh, this chip right here is programmed to go to one of my websites. And if I hold it next to this Nexus 7, the first, it'll just go there. It won't ask me anything, it'll just do it. And if anybody wants to see that demo afterwards, right directly, I can show it to you every time. And it'll just, it just takes it, reads it, it's a URL. So because this URL is handled natively by the NFC stack, it just goes, okay, I'm going to launch the default app for that, which is Chrome, in this case. So, 
There's also another uh, one that's commonly used for to connect to Bluetooth, where you have like one of those remote speakers that's got Bluetooth enabled on it. You you need the, getting the MAC address off of a remote Bluetooth speaker. If you don't have a little piece of paper, it's pain. So what they've done is they put some NFC chips in some of those. You, you can find them if you look hard enough for them. If you don't have that, you can program a chip to do the exact same thing. So what it'll do is you'll hold it next to your phone. It'll say, hey, do you want to connect to this Bluetooth device? You say yes. And the next thing you know, whatever music that you want to play, it's playing. Um, it can be used to do other types of communication like that, where you're handing it off to something else where you want to exchange some data. There's another type, which is negotiated transfer. Now, have you guys seen where you can take two phones and put them together and kind of tap them? That's that. This is that, that's that type of communication. And what happens there is NFC is only a, a go-to <coughs> And what it does is, it first communicates to that, then it renegotiates over another protocol, usually Bluetooth, to do that file type of transfer. So that's how those kind of things work. Um, let's see here. So where's the evil in these? Um, negotiated hand it, it's cool, but it's not very mainstream. You don't see a lot of it anywhere. I mean, you can find, like I said, you can find an NFC-related uh, speaker, and you can find those kind of things, but it's not really out there being used as far as in marketplaces where you can really take advantage of it. Um, there are some things that you can do with it where you can disrupt communication and you get some man-in-the-middle type things where you can say, like, have somebody connect to your device and then have you be the router as a man-in-the-middle type of thing. It's doable, but it's, it's a little more difficult to pull off. Now we get to like the card emulation type of stuff. This is probably where everybody really wants to know what's going on. Okay, card emulation is a way that you can turn your phone into a card. And it doesn't have to be for payment. It can be for other types of stuff. Uh, tokening systems, subways, um, in addition to card payments. And they're all kept in a sleeve or something like a wallet, like Google Wallet or Google Pay or Apple, Apple Wallet and those type of things. Um, the reason why it's come along is because it's quick and it's easy. You just tap and you go. Nothing really extraordinary about that. Um, the thing about it is, is, again, it's really popular in Europe, South America, and in Asia. And I, it kept getting me curious, why is the case of that? And it took a little bit of digging, but I finally figured out at least what somebody, another analyst believes the reason is. And when you get over to Europe, there's not as many banks. They're kind of, there's several large, large banks. And those large banks also control the credit cards that are issued. So they're actually pushing the technology down on you, and that's how it's coming to pass. Versus here, where you can go to your local bank, you can go to a national bank, you can do whatever, and because of that decentralization, the technology push for it isn't as strong here. But it's still here. Apple is kind of trying to make their mark with that, and we'll see if Android Pay can ever get itself off the ground. Uh, so another thing that is actually coming along that's moving us towards that is as of October 15th, or October 1st, 2015, legislation in the U.S. passed a thing that on the max strip readers, that their liability is now shifting from the credit card company to the vendors. So the vendors are like, what am I going to do about that? Well, you can buy this fancy new device that does chip and pen. Oh, by the way, we're going to include NFC with it because that's just the latest thing. It's just in it. So they're getting tap and pay just as part of that process. And you'll see more and more vendors coming along just because they have to upgrade. The one place where they're still allowed to get away with the older stuff and not seek liability is with gas stations. And this, I think, for another year, 2018, I think, is when they have to convert. So you will not find chip and pin or um, the tap and pay at gas stations, not yet, anyway. Well, well, how's it? Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't I haven't, did they just put them in? Yeah, kangaroo as well. All right, I don't go to that one. Sorry. <laughs> All right, but they're starting to get it. So that's the thing is, it's moved. They're be trying to beat the legislation because the thing is, 2018 they have to have it. So they're just they're ahead of everybody else. 
Um, so who offers the NFC payment type systems? Apple Pay, we've got Android Pay, we talked about Google Wallet. Are you anybody familiar with Google Wallet that becomes Android Pay that became Google Wallet again? That it's all over the place. Um, it's just been an album of things, and they haven't been able to get it quite off the ground, so I'm not sure how much I still trust it yet, but I think they're getting close. Um, the other thing is, is Samsung's gotten in the mix of this, and as well as banks. They're starting to offer their own payment cards to do this. Well, this amalgam of stuff means that now NFC vendors or payment, they all have to figure out how to make all this stuff work. And that can create some really interesting things, especially with the tokening systems, which are, like I said, more prevalent in, in Europe, but um, things like uh, uh, bus fares, sky lifts, bike rentals, all those type of things, they're starting to give you the ability to do um, like those frequent user cards. So they're putting NFC in there so they can keep track of your account, and, and so you can reload it and unload it and do all those kind of things. Um, so when are NFC payments active? They're a little bit different. They're not always active when the phone is on. They're only active when you open up the actual app and say, I'm ready to pay. This energizes the actual chip to allow for the transfer of payment. There's two different versions that actually works, which I'll explain here in a minute. You have to be close, but not touching. So you can just be, if you guys are familiar with it, four, centimeters, four to 10 centimeters is as close as you need to get. Now the thing, I'm gonna deviate here for a second, is if you have the cards, they still can be read from your wallet. So if you have a, a, an actual credit card with one of them in it, those can still be energized because they're back to the passive chip type technology. They have, they're a little bit more advanced than that, but still they can be read. And because they can be read, there's times, there's been ways to get data off of them. Um, and if you want to protect yourself, you can get, have you seen, you actually you seen this commercial with the card lock thing? It's not realistic the way they show it, but it does work. I wanted to test one, so I was just like, okay, I gotta see if that actually does do work. Um, what it does is there's, there's like foil on the inside of this, and metal disrupts NFC communication. It won't allow the chips to actually energize correctly, so you can't get it. Um, they also have NFC actual protective wallets, which have an aluminum foil on the outside type of thing, do the exact same thing. But that being said, uh, what happens is when you get near a card, it's energized, and when it energized, it passes the first level of tokenization over, which, from what I've read, I haven't been able to test it, so I don't have an actual card card, is that that token is good for 24 hours. So you, if you have a cloner, and you catch hold of that, you can go and actually do a payment with it. Um, I've seen a couple articles, and I've seen a couple of videos where they actually were able to perform that in Australia, um, but again, I don't have a card to be able to actually test that to see if it's valid. But something to be aware of if you start to get NFC cards. Um, so let's see. So how does the actual NFC payment system work? It's right now it's mitigated to $25 or less in the US uh, with no authentication. So you tap and pay and go on your way. And I've actually used that before. I have it on my I have it on my iPhone. So you can just tap it and go. Just buy your latte, buy whatever it is, as long as it's less than twenty five bucks. Um, if you go larger amounts, it's going to ask you to do the fingerprint authentication. So transactions initiated from the from the terminal will receive the credit card, and then it goes and starts to process it. And then and uh, you've already sent the card over. It collects the data, and then it begins to transact just like a normal card payment type system would. That one little finite piece is just how to get the tokenization part in there, which is the interesting part. Um, the rest of it after that is similar. So now how do they do that? They do it in one of two ways. They have something called a secure element, which has your tokenization in it. I just alluded to it a few minutes ago with the card itself having that token. If you energize it, it will start to send that. Um, in these older Nexus 7s, they have an actual separate chip. It's called a secure enclave. That's what the SE stands for. Um, and it would store the tokenization. You can't get to it via API, although I found the other day on GitHub somebody has managed to figure out how to get into it, at least so you could store your own private data as far as your apps, but not so that you could access others. Um, after that was the thing that got the original Apple Pay, or not Apple Pay, um, Google Wallet in trouble. They figured out how to actually not get into it, but how to snipe that. And that broke their, their encryption and all that kind of stuff. 
So they've reorchestrated it since then, and they've put it as a cloud-based version. So when these things work, what they do is they, they carry the identification, authentication, it holds the tokens, it holds all those type of things, and it looks something like this, where you go to initiate a payment, the NFC controller hands it off to the secure element, the secure element returns back with a token and sends it to the credit card processing piece, and that's basically how it works in a nutshell. So this is working in Google Wallet, the earlier versions, and from what I understand, this is how Apple Pay actually works as well. There is a secure chip in there. One of the things that was also interesting about having it in this mechanism was you didn't have to have an internet connection in order for it to be able to work. Like these tablets that I have down here, they're Wi-Fi only. They're not, I don't have an actual cellular card. So I would be able to do payments with it without having to have any kind of internet connection. From what I understand, the newer version of Apple Pay doesn't, or uh, Android Pay doesn't work that way. It has to get that internet connection in order to be able to do that. Um, I just talked about the run in two modes. Um, let's see here. The other part that they ran into is the, the chip itself and the manufacturers and all these, because you have all these people programming stuff together. It could be a little finicky, and because it was finicky, they went ahead and moved it to the cloud, because Apple didn't have that issue because they could pull everything, right? Right, here's the Cloudway. The Cloudway works almost identical. The only difference is the secure element card itself is not a physical element on the device. It's actually out in the internet. So it just goes out and does the exact same thing it did, produces the token, comes down, shoots it out. The, so where's evil with that? Well, there's a couple things. You can talk about the sniffing cards, which I just hit up a minute ago. If you're issued a card, it can be somewhat sniffed. You can get minor amounts of data on it depending on who the card manufacturer is. Um, they've also proven that you've been able to either do a transaction on your own or get enough information to possibly do identity theft. But it's, it's still kind of fluky because you don't know which card manufacturer is doing that with. We talked about cloning. And then um, you have some things about implementation problems and how the transactioning works and the tokenization, which I'll discuss here in just a second. We have provisioning of phones and stolen data. We also have a relay attack that's in it still is a proof of concept, but it proves that it actually did work. And jailbroken, I think I can explain that one pretty quick. Trojan amps. So let's go into our first app that we're going to talk about. This one is a sniffing cards app. It's called eCard Grabber. Um, it's rather old. You can't find it on the market. It was back in June 2012. Um, obviously, you can tell by some of the names of the card manufacturers that it was over in Europe. And what it allowed them to do was it allowed them to come up with a sniffer, you know, go up next to your purse or to your backside, and you grab information off that card, and you were able to actually, in his case, he was able to do MasterCard, the Gelt card, and one more. I thought there was a Visa card. But anyways, he was able to actually do transactions with two of those just by swiping by them. So pretty interesting stuff there. Um, here is an example. This is another card. This is a tokenization card. And what this is, is this actually took place in about, uh, I think, 2013. He's in a subway, and he's just purchased a card in New Jersey, and it's put seven trips on it. So what he did was he cloned it first, and then he started using it, and he goes, okay, I'm going to go through and I'm gonna, It's just a proof of concept test. He's running out. It only takes a second. Okay, he's got one trip left, right? All right, he's done. He knows, he knows brings his phone back up that he has. He, instead of cloning it, he's now writing back to that same card, and lo and behold, he's got how many? Oh, eight trips left. He's now put all that data back on that card, and the card doesn't know any different because the card's essentially done. And the way the terminal system was working at that point, I don't know if they fixed it since then, they didn't do any checks on whether or not the cards were expired or valid or any of that type of stuff. So those are some of the things that you can do as far as that. And you need Something you can use your phone to clone some of them. There is some software out there in the Play Store that will allow you to read cards and duplicate them. There's also um, this thing, it's called a chameleon. I don't know, some people who are over in Europe would be a little more familiar with it. This was a Kickstarter project about a year ago. It took me about eight months to get it when we finally came out with it. What's cool about this thing is it's a cloner, and it's the idea is not so that you can hack stuff, the idea was to make the guy's life easier. 
And what he had was he had a card for his subway, he had a card for his ski lift, he had a card for his rental bike, he had a card for everything, and he was just like, I'm tired of hearing all these cards. So he created this. And what this does is it clones the card for him, and it can store up to eight of them. You see there's a little battery on the back and everything. And he just keeps this with him, and he recharges it whenever he needs to. So he used it as that. And I found it works relatively effective. You can see the NFC window right here, and there's just a chip on there, and it will store it. It will switch, and it says switch card one, two, three, four, all the way up to eight. And then he can use it to do whatever he wants. So it's a pretty nifty little tool. I've um, just started playing with it, and I just got it about a month ago. So let's see what else. Um, implementation problems. In 2014, there was a flaw that allowed for payment transfers when you transferred from one type of, uh, of money system to another, i.e. US dollars to pounds, uh, pounds to George Marks, whatever. They found the flaw would allow on the system when you're doing the transfer to do up to that amount. That's kind of a big amount, and without any authentication. Um, when was asked, Visa, I think, was the provider of it. They, when they were asked about it, I said, yes, it was a flaw, but the transaction would have never been able to complete, not because the amount wasn't in there, because that would just allow that type of transfer to take place, even though they have a secondary check and balance. Anyways, um, you can read more about it. There's the actual uh, click on for it, so you can read that. Let's see. Uh, provisioning. This one's probably one of the more scary ones. Um, in September 2015, the FBI released a report that said um, provisioning of cards is becoming a new mechanism by which to make mobile payments type of stuff. So what's that mean? Um, if, if you ever provision a card onto one of your devices, it, you only need to know a little bit of data about yourself. So if I've got that kind of information, your personal identifiable identification, I can get a card provisioned onto my phone. The other thing that was interesting about this is, and it's even in the brief there, that Visa, MasterCard, or those, whatever you provision, even though they're not necessarily smart cards, they do, cannot keep track of the card anymore once it's that point, because it's now been a tokenized card. They don't know how many are out there. So if I take one card and I figure out how to provision it, I can, I can make multiple copies of that over and over and over and over and over again, and they're all the same phone. It doesn't whatever it is. So they have no way of controlling it at that point. And because they don't have that way, it doesn't have any ability to undo it. The other thing, which actually I found out recently, which I, I find to be a vulnerability, is if your card, your physical card gets compromised, it does not have any effect on your token. Um, I had my card compromised about two months ago, and my provision card still works. It never, ever stopped. I didn't have to reprovision it or anything like that. So if you've been subject to any kind of identity theft, you've had your phone stolen, or, or you've had your identity taken in that way, and they're provisioning cards that way, you can't get the token gone. You're going to have to call them and, and get them. I don't even know how to undo it at that point, once you've had it. But I know that if you have a compromised card, it doesn't affect your token. Um, let's go into the relay attack. This is from May 2015. And this was a proof of concept, and what these two guys did, um, Eddie Lee, and it was a play on the NFC proxy that you can still get, I think, if you Google around long enough, you can, you can find it. And basically what they did was they took a payment card, they took a phone, actually two phones, they proxied them together and took a payment terminal. So they had the first phone read the card, relay it to the second phone, and initiate a payment across, actually, across the world. One was in like New York, and the other was in Spain. And it looks kind of like this. So what they were trying to prove there was that even though once you access the secure enclave, whichever it be, the cloud or that, if you can get anywhere in between that type of transaction, that you might be able to use it for other means. Um, let's see, where else? OK, I jailbroken and compromised cards. I, can explain that all day long, but everybody knows if you compromise the integrity of your device, you compromise the integrity of everything. So I don't necessarily have to say anything about that. One thing I will note, at least with that, with the Android Pay, if you try to access it or and after you jailbroken or if you try to provision a card after you have messed with your device, 
it will say that it will actually come back with a message that says, hey, I, I don't know about this device, and it won't actually let you do it. Um, so I noticed it with my one that has Kali that I replaced on there, so it wouldn't do it. Um, some other things. Trojan apps. Um, as part of the secure enclave, when you're playing whatever it may be that you're playing and it says you want to do one of those in-house purchases, that's the other place where they're, they're looking at, where they're going, hey, this does have the ability to access your credit card information and charge you. Is there a way for me to actually get that? And they're playing with it because you can tell. They want the money part is what it is. There's a story from about a year ago where a lady had actually provisioned her Starbucks card onto her, onto her device and it was set to auto uh, update. So when she got down to like five bucks or whatever, put another 25 bucks on it, right? And I gotta keep my lattes flowing. Um, she was in the account getting ready to do an update and she, because she noticed the charge, and she's like, okay, she's doing that, and then it went to zero, and then it went charge again, went to zero, charge again. Somehow they had gotten through the provisioning system and got, they were just moving the money out of the credit card account through the Starbucks. So they were using it like to buy more cards or something like that. They never got to the bottom of what the actual, where the money went, but the fact is is that they used an in and out to get that. They didn't attack the card directly, they attacked it through a situation that you set up yourself. So be aware of those when you set up these auto refill type of features, um, that those type of things might, might happen. All right, so you feeling depressed yet? You want to turn off your NFC? All right, there's some ways to protect yourself, honest. I, I, I did look at that too, you might as well figure it out while you're out there. Um, support for NSD is still early, so you don't have to endorse it, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. Um, most evil is not scalable. Because it's not scalable, it's not going to show up on the front page of any paper anytime soon. Unless they compromise like a credit card host company or something like that. Getting you one by one by one is not going to really do anything. So you're just not going to see it that way because it just doesn't scale. Um, but if you're not ready to join that revolution, there's still some hope. You can turn off NFC on your devices, they do have a switch for it. Um, you can also don't provision your credit cards, which we just talked about, or any of your other cards that are into that. Um, if you do get the ones with the RFID type stuff in them, you can do a couple things. You can get this card sleeve that I just talked about, or you can, one guy suggested, just drill a hole right through the chip, which does work. Um, and he's just like, I'm going to do that, and it, and it works just fine. But what if you want to look at NFC? Kind of like what I've done. You try to figure it out. You're going to need a little bit of hardware. You're going to need a little bit of software and spend some time. And you're going to be in some business. Here's a couple things. I had two Android devices that had NFC in them. If you start uh, fishing around to find them, Nexus Sevens, um, Samsung, they, they a lot of them have them. So you can you can get uh, those ones with. Yeah, I bought the. I bought another one that was just off Craigslist. So you can, you can find them. You don't have to get one that has a cellular connection. You can just route it through your Wi-Fi and you're in business. Um, you get something like an a, uh, this ACR122U, uh, which is that white piece right there. That's just an NFC card reader. You can get it. It's got Windows apps. You can do that. You can read cards. You can write cards. Uh, if you get the right software, you can actually emulate uh, like a card payment type system. So it will accept them. Uh, the one down below is from Adafruit. It's just an NFC reader like this. It works with an Arduino. Um, I already showed you the card sniffer. This one here is the version 3 of that green thing up there called Proxmark. This is probably the more powerful of all of them. This one's a couple hundred bucks, uh, depending on which one you get. Um, that will, can do all kinds of stuff. You can do bit manipulation, and you can really start to get into the physics of playing with how the transfer of data goes between one or the other, because it can act like a credit card reader at that point. Um, that one I'm still experimenting with because the API in it is like massive, and it's not very user friendly. Um, for testing software, if you have a device, there's stuff like uh, NFC retag. Um, tag info, NFC tools, tag writer, trigger, um, one called bank card info, which will try to read your card and see if you can pull any of those off. All these are available in Google Store, so or, so you can or Play Store, so you can go out there and play with them all day long, and they'll read and write tags and they'll do all kinds of stuff for you. And if you're going to get that far, you might as well go out to like WizTag or something like that and go ahead and play with some tags and see what you can do. Um, but I didn't do this all by myself. Here's some similar work that's already been done. 
uh, includes fishing with posters, um, how to do some of the hacks, um, some of the things that have, if you go through these, some of these are a little bit older, but if you go to them, you'll find some of the things that used to exist, like no Bluetooth authentication used to exist, now it does. Things that they fixed along the way. Um, and they're constantly, we're out of researchers, we're constantly messing with stuff to try to see what we can break or make next. Um, some other stuff, NFC knowledge, the NFC forum itself uh, has the specifications on protocols. You have to kind of dig around to get the free papers because they want you to kind of join and you're not going to do that because you're not an NFC provider. Um, uh, NXP Semiconductor, who produces most of the NFC chips in the world, um, and XDA developers, they are, uh, they hack the Android stuff back and forth and left and right. So they're going to, you're going to find other developers that might be working in this space and they might be able to help you get whatever it is that what you want to look for. And that's kind of it in a nutshell. I'll open the floor to kind of questions when I still have, I'm not sure how many minutes left. And I can talk about any of these devices that I have up here, what some of the things that I've experienced, or uh, any questions that you have. Anybody? Shooting in the back. Yeah, you. Uh, just an observation. Um, go to uh, Asia. Um, you go to Hong Kong and. Uh, the, the Felicia tags? Uh, Is that where you're going? Uh, no. Um, actually, the uh, octopus. Uh, you can go to the subway and buy lunch. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, it's real simple. You violate it, you're no longer in Hong Kong, you're in mainland, and you're too bright to sell uh, for the rest of your life. The, so, um, the um, Sony just started it to the bank, we actually make the road at home. The stuff uh, there is a little bit more serious for uh, penalty. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh, basically, if you have the laws backing it up, where it's no three strikes around, Yes, uh, and they are starting to do some of that. I, I, obviously, the penalties here in the U.S. aren't quite as severe as losing a hand, but it's still right there. Um, so that is kind of, kind of interesting. I've also seen that another subway card that I saw was in Seattle over the summer, so they, they're out there. There's stuff all over the place. Oh, actually, there's another one. The Port of Tampa, which I, was, I haven't been able to mess with it yet, but they do a tokening system, too. There's just in their parking system. If you pull in and you remember how you used to pull the little pad, the little paper tag type stuff, you know, you get a little thing that looks like just a little circular token. And they must have written the time on it at that point, so it's writing as it goes. You go and park, and when you're done, you put it back in the thing and it tells you how much you have. So I know that they're start these tokening systems are showing up. There's also, I'm from Sarasota, which is a little further south, there is a bar down there that has like 50 some odd taps, and they give you an NFC badge that allows you, you can pour as much as you want. You go and tap whichever one and it turns the tap on. And then you, it, it's registering how much it is and how much that. So I went and played with that for a little while. Very interesting, but I forgot how to get up this at the end. <laughs> Anyways, I hope you guys enjoy. If you have any questions, feel free to hit me up. I'll be here most of the day. Thank you guys.